dog, been outside playing hard, or maybe just ate or drank a large volume all at once, and things were okay, and then they're not. And you notice that that dog is, you know, stiff and short-strided and looks uncomfortable, and maybe even trying to burp or retch. And you might even notice some extra saliva. That's a problem. These dogs are prone to a twisting and filling of gas of the stomach called bloat. In case we haven't met, I'm veterinarian Dr. Jeff Nickel, and this is our family dog, Miss America, and this is Gaston, and here's Tony. They're enjoying a couple of these little hunting feeder toys for cats. Keep them out of trouble. This is not about them, but they're here. So, thank you for tuning in, and just make sure that I'm reaching people and you can hear me loud and clear, please hit the wow button. And if you find this information helpful, please hit the heart because that way I know I'm doing something valuable for you. Um, and so let me, uh, let me get into this thing a little bit and tell you more about it. Most people with these large breed, deep chested dogs, Great Danes, German Shepherds, Irish Setters, um, Great Pyrenees, there's a, there's a list, we'll get into those later. Um, many people are aware of this problem called bloat and they're worried about it and there's a lot of misinformation out there. And so let me be very clear about these things. These are medical and surgical emergencies and your dog's survival will have a whole lot to do with how quickly you can recognize that you may have a problem. And you know, in, in a veterinary practice, one of the best things that ever happens is people coming in the door with a pet and saying, oh my goodness, I think I have a problem, and we evaluate and go, you're okay. And we'll explain what's going on and treat the what's, what really is at issue. I would much rather do that. And believe me, any veterinarian who's been at this for very long has had cases come in where people thought, well, you know, I couldn't tell if it was a problem, so we thought we'd wait and see. Please don't go down that path. Uh, we lose lives because people waited too long because they weren't sure. So. This is what we're going to look for. Um, it's a sudden onset problem. And in fact, some dogs have been known to die suddenly of it and nobody can do anything. I don't mean to upset people with large breed dogs, but there are some of these you can't derail. Um, but it is a sudden twisting of the stomach and it's a filling with gas. And the gas builds up fast and it's in the stomach itself, which is in the forward portion of the abdomen. And the stomach swells so big that it puts pressure on the underside of the major vein called the posterior vena cava. And this big vein drains blood from the posterior two thirds of the dog's body to the heart. And when that venous return, thank you very much. I'm glad I'm, somebody's paying attention, good. <laughs> um, and um, you've got this sudden um, worsening, uh, diminished return of blood to the heart these guys go into shock in a hurry, and that's when things go to pieces um, and we get some serious problems. So I'll tell you a story about a case I saw that, that actually did well, but it was pretty dicey. This is an eight-year-old German Shepherd named Harry, a wonderful dog, and he loved his family and loved to play hard, and they were out playing Frisbee in the yard. And they, uh, everybody was jumping around and having a great time, the kids and the folks and everybody, and they came inside to rehydrate. And so Harry went to the bowl and, you know, tanked up on a whole lot of water and everybody else was relaxing and having a glass of juice, uh, you know, after having a, an active time out in the yard. And then dad looked over at Harry and realized that that little guy uh, was standing, he expected him to be lying down resting as he usually did after a lot of hard exercise. And he's standing there kind of hunched and, um, uh, when they got him to walk at all, he took these short strides like he had a really bad bellyache. And I'll tell you, if that still small voice in the back of your head says, dog has bellyache, believe that you're probably right. Um, and then they noticed a little bit of drool coming off his, his lips and he was making these mild, almost hard to recognize attempts to, you know, retch and, and, and maybe vomit a little, but he couldn't. Well, they called, they called my hospital and they brought, I told them, hey, get Harry down ASAP. And they did, took him about 15 minutes to get there. Um, and by the time he'd come in, he was already getting so weak that he was having a hard time standing. The color of his gums was getting pale because he was going into shock. 
and he was um, in trouble. So after a brief exam showed that GDV, gastric dilatation volvulus, also known as bloat, top of the list uh, by the way his abdomen sounded and palpated and simply the way it appeared. You stand a dog like this up and you look at them from the side and about midway between the shoulders and the hips, you'll see a, the abdomen is somewhat swollen. Now don't wait to be really clear on that to suspect this problem, but that's often noticeable with these things because the stomach is filling with gas so fast that it's getting really big. And again, the real worry is that the compression on the major venous return of blood to the heart that throws them into shock so quickly. So we went ahead right away and gave Harry a sedative and then uh, passed a stomach tube to relieve as much gas as we could and then got him to the x-ray room. And this is what we found on our x-ray. And let me show you this. And I, you're probably not as well versed in reading x-rays as I am, but you notice that big black area in the abdomen? Well, gas or air x-rays black. In fact, this part right here is the last posterior portion of the lung, which is mostly air and that naturally uh, shows up as black on x-ray. But look at that enormous black area in the abdomen. This dog's stomach is enormous. And I'll tell you what, you didn't have to, uh, we didn't have to spend very long reading the x-ray. We knew exactly what we were doing. Uh, Richard, nice to see you. Thank you for showing up. So, um, Harry went right to surgery. Now, on our way, we got an electrocardiogram, and as is the case with many of these dogs, he had abnormal heart rhythms. And by golly, you've got to be careful with those because you give anesthesia and, and those aren't recognized. We can have an anesthetic disaster. Um, so we started him on an IV lidocaine drip and got that under control and uh, got that joker into surgery. Uh, so first thing I noticed in there was even as short a time as this problem had been in motion, um, there was an area of the stomach wall that had lost some of its blood supply. Well, we had... Um, uh, you can't leave that. Um, so very carefully determine which area was still well supplied with blood. Um, and after releasing more gas and getting the stomach to get a lot smaller, as it normally should be, removed that part of the stomach so there wasn't any going to be any gamble with that dying later on us. Close that up with a two-layer, uh, what's called an inverting pattern, so that these things don't leak. And we leak test them as well, and then very carefully rotated that stomach back into its natural healthy position. Now you can simply get out of the abdomen then and move on because you don't want to spend any more time under anesthesia with a case like this than absolutely necessary. But these guys can tours all over again. They can have the same problem again later. So it really behooves everybody if we can anchor the part of the stomach called the pylorus or near the pylorus, that's the outflow of the stomach, to the inner wall of the abdomen. And we do that with, there's a variety of different methods. My favorite has always been what's called the belt loop gastropexy. Gastro always refers to stomach and pexy is when we permanently attach something. Um, there are other methods that are what's called the incisional method. It's really a matter of, of the surgeon's uh, experience and, and what you can do quickly and what will remain permanent so that when we anchor that stomach where it belongs, then if the dog's playing hard and running around in the future or drinks or eats too much all at once or some other predisposing factor, um, the stomach has a pretty hard time twisting. Interestingly, it can still happen, but the likelihood is very small. So doing this as a preventative against a reoccurrence, super important. So we got Harry out of surgery and he recovered. Um, and we watched them super careful. Um, two days later, we got him to eat, uh, which was a really positive sign. His blood counts were looking good. His temperature was remaining stable. It's always a little elevated following surgery, but it didn't stay very high. It came back down to the normal range. And after four days, we sent him home and he did fine. Very careful instructions um, to baby these guys so that they can recover and, and do fine. So, I mean, why are these things happening in the first place? Some of the reasons were not real clear, but the, the stomach sits differently in the forward portion of an abdomen of a large breed dog, especially these deep chested body types. And if they're lean on the outside, they don't have as much normal 
fat on the interior of the abdomen, and that appears to be a factor, although it's not real clear why. There does appear to be a genetic predisposition. Now you can say, well, of course, I mean, big breed dog, it's parents with big breed dogs. Well, if your large breed dog has a member of, of the first degree, that is, somebody like a sibling, a litter mate, for example, or a mother of, or a father who has a history of GDV, then your dog is more likely uh, to have this problem. And I'll tell you in a minute why it's valuable to understand the likelihoods, although any large breed dog ought to be watched carefully for this thing. Um, another predisposing factor, interestingly, is temperament. Uh, anxious, nervous dogs have a greater risk. That we're not clear on either, but we know that that's the case. Uh, we also know that those who eat or drink a large volume all at once, that can put them at risk. Um, and right after exercise, in fact, if they've eaten or drunk a lot and then gone out and run and played hard, they are at risk of twisting the stomach. The spleen sort of hangs off the greater curvature of the stomach, and it can act as a pendulum and with a lot of play and horsing around, if there's a big volume of fluid, you know, water or food in the stomach, then it can flip and twist. So, you know, you want to uh, not exercise for a couple hours after eating. I, if you've got a dog who eats really fast, you can feed the dog through things like food toys. Gaston and Tony are enjoying a little bit of dry cat food out of these little food. Well, you guys have emptied it. Boy, you're pretty clever cats. Um, this is a food toy. I show this often in these Facebook Lives. It's called a twist and treat. They come much bigger than this for big dogs. Um, lots of different kinds of food toys that keep dogs occupied foraging and only allowing them to get small amounts of food on a sort of continual basis instead of just, you know, in, in, inhaling a whole bowl all at once. Um, so those are the big... Uh, those are the big factors. And interestingly, by the way, middle-aged to older dogs are at greater risk. And I look at most cases, including Harry that I just discussed, he was eight years old. Uh, doesn't mean it can't happen in a one or two year old big dog, but middle-aged to older is more common. So the symptoms, just bear these in mind. If your dog is pretty suddenly uncomfortable, there's a big, big red flag. Um, pretty suddenly unwilling to eat, Big problem, these guys do not eat. Uh, pretty suddenly acting like it wants to retch. That dog's in trouble. Uh, the drooling, you know, dog doesn't normally do that. You know, big St. Bernard's, they do it every day. But many of these big dogs are not that spitty and drooly. And so if your dog starts doing that, it's a problem. Unwilling to lie down, I mean, there's a problem, mid-abdomen, okay? So be watchful. General mortality rate, even with surgery, uh, most studies have shown that about 15 to 28 percent of these dogs don't make it. There was one study, and there's always an outlier, but this had 339 dogs, and they found that just shy of 40 percent of the dogs died. Um, they didn't make it. And um, Wendy, hi, my Airedale gets a bowl of kibble each in about a half a second. Airedales are not among the big breeds. In fact, Wendy, let me... And I, was going to try to commit this to memory. I mean, I've had experience with most of these breeds, but this is the order of their risk, and they've done these statistical studies. So Great Danes are the big one with a lifetime risk of 39%. And I've done these on Great Danes. 39%, um, that's almost 4 out of 10. Um, and I'm going to tell you why, again, you're going to need to know this going forward. Other breeds that are commonly affected are Standard Poodles, St. Bernards, Irish Setters, Gordon setters, and again, big breeds, deep chest, because the stomach hangs a little differently than, say, a medium-sized dog like a, like a Border Collie, like Miss America here. Weimaraners, Irish Wolfhounds, huge dogs, Newfoundlands, Akitas, German Shepherds, uh, Dobermans, Collies, Rottweilers, Bernese Mountain Dogs, Boxers, and Mastiffs. And you know what's interesting about this list is that you'll think, well, not all of these, uh, you know, are giant breed dogs, and the very biggest of them don't necessarily rise to the top of the list in terms of likelihood. Um, so, you know, there are differences, and again, genetics uh, can play a part in this thing. So, the thing that I would do, and I recommend to everybody who I see with a large breed puppy, is that when that little rascal comes in for its spaying or neutering, it's under anesthesia, it's a perfect time for the doctor to 
Pexy the Stomach, P-E-X-Y. Or if you really want to sound like I know what you're talking about, you tell them that you want a gastropexy. In other words, we're going to permanently anchor that stomach to the interior wall of the abdomen to make it almost impossible, pardon me, to twist. Um, very often, uh, surgeons who are very uh, skilled with a laparoscope, um, they can spay a dog with a lap, uh, through a laparoscope. You don't have to make a long incision, a very short incision to get the scope in. And they can also do the gastropexy. They can anchor that stomach uh, to the interior wall of the abdomen through a laparoscope. Um, anesthetic time is less, um, and there's less discomfort with surgery. And you think, how important is that? Well, if you've got one of these dogs and you've been through this, and you talk to any person who's, who's enjoyed the, a life with a large breed dog who's had a GDV, a bloat in the past, they will tell you it is worth it. It's worth the expense because you can sleep better at night and you don't have that much to worry about. Now, you know, you would still keep your dog from eating big bowls of food all at once or drinking huge amounts of water all at once. But the call to action on this is get those big dogs pexied. Um, you're welcome, Richard. So, if there are any other questions, this is a great time to run past me. But if you see this later, or if you have a question later, you're welcome and encouraged to put it on my Facebook page. And I really appreciate the questions because it gives me a chance to, you know, sometimes people think, God, is that, was that important? Yeah, if you don't know the answer, it's important. If there's any chance it might save your pet's life, it's worth asking. So you're welcome to send me questions later. Um, or questions on anything for that matter, regarding pets that is, um, send them to me on my Facebook page. Um, and so you can get these Facebook Lives. I do them almost every week. Uh, I usually have been doing them on Thursday evenings. I thought I'd try a Monday afternoon this time um, to see if more people would be available to watch. And if you, um, if you want to get these every week in your email box, simply go to my website, drjeffnickel.com, D-R-J-E-F-N-I-C-H-O-L.com, and go to my website and subscribe. And it's no charge, of course. And when you subscribe, um, every Tuesday morning, you'll not only get the Facebook Live from the week before, but also my weekly media blog, which is what we nowadays call things like my newspaper column, which I put in the Albuquerque Journal, and you'll get that the week following as well. Um, I try to split that, my column evenly between cats and dogs and between behavioral problems and other physical issues. Um, most of my Facebook Lives are on behaviors, but there are some physical things that are absolutely essential. I've got many years of experience in emergency medicine and general practice. And uh, finally, um, after quite a number of years in general medicine, I did a residency in, in uh, veterinary behavior medicine, which is what I practice now. Um, these are brain disorders that result in abnormal behaviors. But I'll tell you what, the physical stuff is a very big part of, of what I see in the emergency hospital where I practice, and I'm, I want you to be aware of these things and steer clear of them if you can. So thank you again for watching, and um, uh, don't eat tea. No need to wreck the furniture. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> they don't always behave. They don't always behave the way they should. You know, they sometimes. Uh, yeah, I need a little reminder of, of a healthy decorum around the home. So thank you again for uh, tuning in. I'm Dr. Jeff Nickel, Miss America. Say goodbye to our friends, Gaston, Tony. Thanks very much. Have a great week.